Um, this evening I'm going to be just sharing really three resources for thinking about some of the theological and biblical resources we have in our tradition for responding to this strange year and this strange situation we find ourselves in. And before we begin with that, um, we're going to just have a moment of prayer. Um, I'm sure you've all had pretty mixed experiences of praying over Zoom and Teams and other sorts of platforms like this these last few months. Um, and I have gone for something with a response, but obviously the intention is that you remain muted um, for the response. But please do say it. Please do um, kind of make it your prayer and, and join in. Um, I'm going to just start sharing my screen and hoping that that all works straightforwardly, which it looks like it is. Um, you'll see there that as the um, advertised title of the talk was moving on from lockdown, how can theology and the Bible help? Um, this morning after yesterday's various press conferences and announcements, I decided to change it from moving on from lockdown as it felt like we were <laughs> moving very far on from lockdown after all. So um, instead we're looking at facing the next six months, how can theology and the Bible help? So just in a moment of silence, just bringing to God all that you have arrived at this point with, everything that's on your mind, all of your anxieties and all of the concerns and joys and challenges of the day. We remember that we are here above all because we seek the Lord because we seek God's presence, because we seek to know and experience the love of God with us. One thing that I have asked of the Lord, this is what I see, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Who is it? that you seek. We, we seek. seek the Lord our God. Do you seek him with all your heart? Amen. Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your soul? Amen. Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your mind? Amen. Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your strength? Amen. Christ, have mercy. And so, Lord, we pray that as we spend this time together this evening, that what we will see is more of you, more of your work in this world, more of your presence and of your mercy, and more of the ways in which you call us to be your people. Amen. One of the things um, about doing these things over Zoom, many of you will um, have realised long before now, is how difficult it is to get a reaction um, from the room to guess where people are. And of course, there's something about people sitting in their own homes um, where they can look very comfortable or very distracted or very like they're doing all sorts of other things um, as well. And I, I enjoy um, sort of talking to groups of people um, and you know, joking and um, kind of sharing that sense of being together with them. And like so many other things, we've had to adapt to doing that a bit differently in, in this format. Um, so what I've found so far is that jokes that would have like got at least a ripple of laughter in a room fall completely flat on Zoom. Nobody even looks like they're kind of <laughs> still necessarily awake. So um, I'm just asking you really to bear with me and, and even humour me with a smile now and again. I, I would really um, <laughs> kind of enjoy that. Um, it is difficult to gauge sort of whether people are connecting with what we're saying um, in a, over these kind of formats. And of course, part of this is about us exploring something together. And so it's helpful to, to get some sort of sense of what's interesting to you, what feels relevant for your particular context. So as um, Martin was saying at the beginning, I've split this evening's conversation into three sections, hoping to give you a chance to sort of react um, in, in different ways to the different parts of the conversation. And when we first talked about this session, um, 
Tug and, and, and Martin asked me to do something on the kind of theological and biblical resources we have for emerging from lockdown. And of course, that's a pretty tall order. We have a tradition which is absolutely full of all sorts of rich and varied and amazing resources. And I hope that for some of you, lockdown has been a space in which you might have discovered some new of the kind of riches of our tradition that you might have discovered some different ways to pray or read or connect um, and that that might have um, given you a space to, to sort of understand something new about what it is that it means to be a follower of Jesus. I think that our theological and biblical resources are extremely plentiful um, and of course in a short evening like this we, we're not going to sort of cover the wealth of, of what it is that we have to offer and so I wanted to just pick out three um, kind of main things to focus on and of course that there are literally hundreds and thousands we could have gone for but the three main resources I want to reflect on are um, first of all the, the the sort of question or the idea about God's people be, having been through even stranger times than this one. The Bible of course is full of stories of God's people and by no means do they have a smooth path through life and I think even the strangeness of this year probably, probably pales into insignificance compared to some of the things that the people of Israel and the early Christians found themselves facing. I, the second one is thinking about the way in which um, theological and biblical resources root us in the universal call to be, God, to be God's people. That call remains true regardless of what's happening around us, regardless of what age and time we're in. And those resources also remind us of what is eternal and what is temporary. And some of the things that we're called to discern in a challenging time like this is what do we let go of? What do we let pass? And what do we hold on to that are core to who we are as God's people? And so they're the kind of three um, different focuses we're going to explore a little bit together um, during this session. Um, so in other words, and more specifically, thinking about vocation, what it means to be called as God's people. Um, having a look at Psalm 137, and then thinking a bit about the eschatological tension. And um, that's just, I, I like to drop that out wherever possible as, as a phrase, um, but really all it means is the now and the not yet of, of God's kingdom. It sounds so much more sort of, um, well, either off-putting or impressive, depending on the way you look at these things, if, if you talk about the eschatological tension. But it's simply Jesus' teaching that the kingdom is both here and is also yet to come. So they're the three um, things that we're going to um, kind of e explore and reflect on together. Um, uh, it's nice to see a few Litchfield faces amongst the gathered um, crew this evening. And, and some of you will know that um, I've had a particular role in Litchfield Diocese around uh, vocation. And as a lay director of vocation, I have an absolute passion for um, the idea that vocation is far, far more than the call to ordination. Significant as that is, every person, I believe, is called by God. Every person is loved and is uniquely gifted. And for everybody, there is a particular way for the growth of the kingdom that we are invited to live that gifting out. And one of the things I think we sometimes overlook about that is that what that means is that vocation is good news to the world. How often do people know that they are loved and gifted, that they are called, that they have something unique to offer to their community, to their society, to the rest of the world? And I really think that the more we can say that to people, they begin to get a sense of why we talk about the good news of Jesus, why we think it's good to be people created in the image of God, why it might be good news for them as well, that they are called, that they really matter, and that if they don't live out their calling, it's not something somebody else can do instead. It is only them who can become fully themselves, fully the person they were made and are called to be. 
And I think another really important aspect of vocation is the corporate aspect. So we very often focus on vocation as being about an individual and about their life, perhaps about their role or perhaps about the sort of person they're called to be. And every person has, has a calling. But every church also has a vocation, a particular calling to be what it is that they're called to be in their context with the resources that that church has, with the opportunities it has, given the setting it's in, the sort of building it might have, all the different things that make that church unique are also the things that help us to discern what its calling might be. And perhaps that is also true of every deanery as well. That together, as God's people, we have particular callings to work out. That knowing what they are, for in a church, if you know what lots of individuals call people's calling is, you might know what that church's calling is. If you know in a deanery what the different churches are called to, you're going to get an idea of what the deanery's calling is as well. So deaneries have a really important role to play in this process of discerning who is it we're called to be together. Because none of us are called to be everything on our own, and that's true of churches as well as it's true of individuals. You know, even though we've sort of sometimes operated with the idea that one priest is called to be and do everything. We know that that's not really true. And no church either is called to be and do everything. And that's where deaneries can really help churches to together offer a full range of mission and ministry without each church having to offer every single thing that they might in an ideal world think was a good thing to do. And one of the things I think it matters to notice about the vocation of the church is that it is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. The church is called into being as the body of Christ. It is there to, well, we'll go on to talk about what it's there to do. But of course, the truth and the eternal truth of that calling um, plays out differently in different times and different places. Every new context that we find ourselves in doesn't change our vocation, but it changes how we live it out. And again, of course, that's the same for individuals as it is for the church. So I had to go at thinking a bit about what the vocation of the church might mean. And this is an offering because I fully accept that everybody will come up with a different definition or a different set of priorities in determining what you think the vocation of the church is. And I thought that first of all, and above all, the vocation of the church, the calling of the church means that God's love for all people is proclaimed at all times and in all places. That's what we exist for, what and who we are called to be together. The vocation of the church means that there are spaces and communities where everyone can find a welcome, can find a belonging, can find a space, to join in with. And of course, that's about buildings and physical spaces, as well as being about bodies of people and, and family networks and all of the things that are true about the church. And I think that really when the church is living out its vocation, it also means that the vulnerable have someone to stand with them and enable them to be heard. That that is one of the really challenging roles of, of the church. And that's one I've given a lot of thought to um, these last few weeks. When I first wrote um, this bullet point, it said the vulnerable have someone to stand with them and speak for them. Now, one of the things about the Black Lives Matters uh, events of this year really made me reflect on that phrase to speak for. And actually, I've sort of come to the, the conclusion that it isn't right for those of us who have a voice and a platform to speak for others, but it's to welcome them onto our platform so their voice can be heard too. And I think the church has so many platforms, some of which we're brilliant at using, some of which we're not quite so good at utilising, but all of which we can share with those who really don't have a voice, who aren't heard, and who because of that are vulnerable. And to me, that's a really exciting calling of the church, to be there to, to stand with the vulnerable and enable them to be heard. Um, 
I imagine that some of you are already thinking, oh, well, you didn't say this and you didn't say that, which for you are really important things um, about the vocation of the church. Uh, and one of the kind of joys of vocation is as soon as you start asking, what are we really for? What are we really called to? It opens such a kind of broad and deep conversation um, that it's very hard to pick three things that, that you're going to go with. So by no means are these supposed to be definitive or exclude what your own sense of that might be. They're just an offering of what I, some of the things I think that it might mean to say that the church has a particular vocation. And that's where our shared vocation is really significant. And of course, for this context, thinking about um, Deedon is thinking about the Church of England, thinking about the context we find ourselves in, in September 2020, we need a sense of what is distinctive about our calling to be God's people here and now. So we know what it means always, in all times and in all places. But what does that look like in the here and now? And so those local churches know that they are a collection of individual vocations. And deaneries might know that they are a collection of churches' vocations. And there's a real opportunity, I think, to, to do something with that. Um, in Litchfield Diocese, we're just about to start um, a piece of work with our deaneries, wondering how, when we look at them as kind of wider units of mission than just parishes or benefices, we can offer so much more together and so much more effectively without the sort of pressure of every church trying to, to do everything. And one of the things that I think is really important about vocation is that as well as helping us discern what we are called to, it helps us to work out what we are not called to. In order to work out your vocation, you have to know what's not for you as well as what is for you. And I think that's one of the most freeing parts of that whole journey of discovering um, what God calls you to. To be able to say, that's not my calling, that's not for me. Um, and those of you who have a strong sense of calling may well have experienced that, where people assume that therefore it must be to ordination. Um, so you might well recognise that sort of sense of you know you're called, that God has something for you, is doing something through you, whatever your own language for that is. And when you try and express that to people, they say, aha, <laughs> it must be ordination, that must be the, the route for you. And actually, when you realise, um, for the people who are not called to that, I'm not obviously talking about the people who are called to ordination at, at this point, but when you realise that that isn't it, it's very freeing to be able to say, no, <laughs> it's not that actually. It is something, but it doesn't take that, that particular shape. And I think for churches, we've got some work to do in freeing ourselves from the idea that we are called to do and be everything. So the sort of classic thing of a, a church in a village with an elderly population and an elderly congregation who are angst ridden about the fact they don't run a youth club. Well, there might be a few young people in your village and it would be brilliant if you had the resources to reach them with the good news of Jesus. But there's probably going to be other ways to do that than actually running a youth club. And it's pretty unlikely in that particular setting that the real vocation of your church is to a group of people who mostly don't exist in your, <laughs> in your vicinity, in your context. So working out what we're not really frees us to work out what we are as well, what we are called to do, who it is that God invites us to be. Um, so as um, Martin was saying earlier, I'm gonna give you a chance um, now just to um, put any questions you might have in the chat um, bar. Um, but also, I'm hoping that this sort of space for questions might work in two ways. Um, so the other bit of it is these three questions which are on your screen. I invite you perhaps to jot down um, and take away with you to think a little bit about for yourselves. Um, and I think this is the space in you working through these questions where the kind of resource becomes something you put into action. It helps you to work out what to do next in this particular context. So how would you summarise the vocation of your own local church? What do you think the really um, 
core bit of that calling is. And of course, we all share some calling to be, um, you know, the, to gather the people of God, to worship, to care, to, to um, be a blessing to our community. But what does that really look like for you in your context? What are the specifics about that? What can your church do that other churches aren't in a context or a position to do? Knowing what the vocation of your church is, is probably going to be quite a different way of asking that question now than it would have been in January. Partly because we've seen so much of what churches are actually capable of and the level of connection in communities, the level of adapting um, has really given us a sense of where the core of the church is in a lot of cases. So what's its constant vocation? What are the things that we're always called to be and do as church? And how might it be called to live that out in the coming months? Um, and I think that the word hope here is going to be hugely important. Um, we are people of hope. Um, there is hope in us, which we are required to give account of, to share with the world. And I think particularly when the world feels a bit hopeless, it is even more important um, to be able to find a way to share that hope with others. Um, and I have more and more thought as we've gone through this time that the act of hope is really quite a, a kind of countercultural act. It's almost a defiant act to say things around us look a bit bleak and sometimes very bleak, but I choose to be hopeful. But for me, that's the kind of exciting challenge of, of, of what it means to, to be a Christian and to live out that general hope in a, in a difficult time. And how can your deanery help the different churches to live out their vocation? How might you enable them together to think about, well, you can do this bit and another church does this and someone else does that. And together we're offering such a good kind of range of coordinated mission and ministry or even to sort of be a critical friend to them and help them to work through some of the discernment questions about what that church is really for. So if you've got questions around those three questions, that's great, but otherwise they might be useful ones for you to take away and, and sort of move this from a, a kind of reflective bit of information to what does that really look like then for you and where does it lead you in your own context? Um, a specific biblical resource around um, this time that we, we find ourselves in. Um, and I, I mean, I know that we all know this, but I just sort of frame this in terms of, well, is this something that God's people know? Have God's people ever been in strange times before? And of course, the <laughs> answer is absolutely yes. Um, the Bible tells us um, kind of several different stories, and in a sense, one very long story of God's people constantly finding themselves in danger, in turmoil, in difficulty, um, in fear of their enemies, and constantly then being reminded by God that God is still present, God still calls them, God is still faithful, God is still working salvation amongst them. And in some of those accounts, they kind of turn back to God, and then we have the, the kind of same cycle um, over and over again. Um, but faith in God never prevents the people from finding themselves in difficult places or times. But it does mean that God is always present with them in whatever those situations are. And it does mean that there is always hope. And I, I mean, there's a sense in which trying to pick out a particular Bible passage to reflect on this, um, there's just so many that, that it could be. And, and the way in which the Bible is a resource for us at this time is going to be both a, a kind of shared endeavor and deeply personal for people and um, you know I, I really love when you have conversations about what's your favorite bible passage or what's a, a bible passage that's been important to you recently how people will come up with such unexpected things that they just heard in a service or came across in morning prayer and it just really stuck with them and um, so in morning prayer i can't remember what day but pretty recently we had um Paul and Silas singing in the prison, didn't we? And then the earthquake. 
and it really stuck with me you know it sort of says um and about midnight paul and silas were singing hymns of praise to god and you sort of think this is a mad story like what <laughs> what's going on here like what's that singing about um and we know that the other prisoners can hear them but we're not quite told that's why they're singing so we wonder is it witnessing is it defiance is it connecting with who at their core they are and why they can endure their suffering like there's all sorts of reasons that that could be um happening and it probably is some kind of combination of of all of them but it, it's really played on my mind that challenge of at midnight in a cell <laughs> You know, and we're sort of 2020 is midnight in a cell for, for lots of us. Do, do we sing songs of praise? Like, do, do we do that? And, um, you know, obviously I've sort of read that passage before, heard it before, but it's never stuck with me the way that it has um, kind, of, kind of this week. Um, but it isn't, in fact, that passage that I wanted us to just have a look at this evening. Um, it is Psalm 137. Um, some of you will immediately have Boney M's version of this floating around in your heads and you won't be able to shake it out for the next week or so. You're very welcome. <laughs> I hope you enjoy hearing it on um, repeat in your head. One of the things about this um, psalm, which I think is absolutely fascinating, um, and of course, which we like to sort of stop at verse seven or eight and not get to the end of and not read those shocking words of, of, of verse nine. It's partly that um, I, I, I'm sure that most of you would know the Boney M version of this to music or recognize it if you heard it. It's a very upbeat music to actually what is quite a, a kind of heartbreaking song. So we start off with this kind of lament of, um, you know, for Jerusalem and, and this excruciating experience that as displaced people, our captors are telling us, sing the songs of Zion, sing praises to your God. And how can we do that when we're possibly here? And yet, how can we forget as well? We must hold on to who God is. And then also look what's happened to us and the wrongs that have been done to us and happy are the people who experience what the revenge that we, we've had to put up with the terrible things. And it's really a kind of heightened emotional kind of psalm, um, which the kind of slightly bebop sound of, of the song doesn't really um, kind of convey to us. And I thought about this psalm a lot during kind of lockdown and, and the idea of the strange land of course and how from sort of um, March through spring and summer it felt like we were in several different strange lands it wasn't just one constant but it was a kind of emerging um, strange land that we kept getting used to and I wondered really um, what other resources this psalm was offering us um, for a strange time what is it kind of helping us to see about what it means to be God's people when everything around us feels not just unfamiliar, but also threatening. Um, I, I don't know about you, but that sense of the, the kind of virus at the window <laughs> was really strong for, for me early, in the early days of this and, and has kind of, I suppose, just become familiar and has kind of softened a bit now. But that sense that there was a real threat um, to, to us, to our communities, to our families, but was very, very strong. Um, and how, how do we connect with God when that's closing in on us, when that's occupying our thoughts, when that takes our energy? How do we connect with God when we can't go into church, we can't sing, we can't meet together, we can't do the things that connect us and reorientate us back to saying, God is God and we are God's people in the way that we've relied on for many of us for a long time um, to do. And I think actually um, this psalm, including verse nine, gives us an awful lot of resource um, to do that. Um, but I thought rather than, than me um, kind of just waffling on about it, you might want to have a chance just to reflect on it in small groups. So I think... Um, we're going to have opportunity, I'll read that when we um, come back, to um, go into small groups for about eight-ish minutes. Is, is that okay? Um, and you'll be in fours and fives and just really whatever strikes you about Psalm 137. 
just notice your actual reaction to it as, as you look at the words. Um, and some bits are probably more, it's short, but still some bits of it are probably more familiar than, than others. And just perhaps um, share together a bit about what do you think it might offer us for the next few months? What, what might it help us to see about how God is at work with us? it's not yet the fulfillment it's not yet the thing that we're looking for and it's helpful for us to remember that it's not the answer to the journey that God is leading us on and one of the things that um, I think that also helps us to think about and again which troubled me a bit early on um, in lockdown particularly was the sort of sense of well we'll just get through this time we'll get through these three months we'll get through this year we'll get through this and then we'll be back to normal. Um, when we can sing again, it will all be okay. I've heard that quite a few times just this week. When we can sing in church again, we'll be back to normal and we'll be able to start doing things again. That, that's when we, <laughs> we kind of know we'll be Christians again somehow. And there's some truth in that, isn't there? Because um, I, I'm Methodist by background. And, um, you know, singing in the Methodist tradition, it is how we know who we are. It's how we learn our theology. It's how we offer our praise. It's how we form as congregations. But it isn't at its core what it means to be a Christian, of course. Um, and so we're not called to just wait till those things are better or more as we're used to them. Every day, our calling remains the same, to become more and more like Christ, to live more and more in the kingdom. Um, not to get through until we're in better times and of course if we think back to psalm 137 the answer isn't just that you wait until you're back in jerusalem to sing the lord's song that psalm itself is a song to the lord but it is a song of lament not of praise so we find different ways to connect at different times but we don't just wait to connect until everything's back in something that we recognize as the status quo. Our calling as Christians, as churches, as deaneries, isn't to go back to how things were. It isn't to find a new normal. It isn't to even things out. It is the same as it always was, to inhabit the kingdom of justice, peace and joy. And that is a real challenge because we are by nature people who like familiarity, who like settledness, who like certainty. And our church has often represented those things for us amidst a life which is full of change and challenge. But ultimately, it isn't the church's business to find the new normal, to find a status quo. It is to find those glimpses of the kingdom of God and to build them, to grow them, to invest in them, to pray for them, to focus on them, to share the good news of them. That's who we are and what we're about. And the other thing I don't like about the phrase the new normal is I don't think normal is really a particular value of the gospels or of the kingdom. Um, you don't see much, do you, in Jesus's interactions with people that could in any way be kind of categorized as normal. I really don't think anyone encountered Jesus and went, well, that was a very normal experience. I mean, kind of quite the opposite, isn't it? Um, and the thing about God at work in the world is that it is constantly new, surprising, challenging, radical, full of more grace than we could ever imagine, more love than we could imagine, more joy than we can imagine, more hope than we can imagine. Um, and that is much more exciting than something which we recognise as, as normal. And I think we're in danger of domesticating too much if we try and normalize it. And you might think I'm making a bit too much of the new normal phrase here, but I think it has the possibility of lulling us into a different phase than the one we call to right now. And um, I think it has the possibility of making us think, let's make this feel safe and pleasant. And there's not, there's nothing wrong with that and we need bits of that but that's not our overall calling as church as, as Christians that's not the way God interrupts 
the world. That's not the way Jesus was with people and is with people um, today. So I think we kind of want to lift our eyes beyond the new normal um, to, to what it is that we see of the kingdom of God um, behind that, really. And I think that's that's our moment um, for churches. This this is the kind of um, precipice on which we stand, really. This is what we're facing into the next six months. How do we look for those signs of the kingdom? How do we look for God at work in old and new ways? How do we look for what's eternally true and has been our constants in all sorts of different situations and modes of life? And for that which is true only of this context, but is no less God at work in surprising and challenging radical ways. So my sort of questions, um, again, either for you to actually engage with now on the chat or perhaps for you um, to reflect on um, as we sign off this evening. How might the tension between the now and the not yet of the kingdom resource us for this next six months? Um, and it does feel to me like as Christians, we should be practiced in the not yet having arrived, in living in that space of tension. Um, and I, I really feel that's what these next few months are going to be like for an awful lot of people and actually if we've got a narrative other than that is just a bad situation but that it can be a creative situation a holy space we might really have a resource to offer to our own communities our own church communities but our wider communities as, as, as well there in what new or different ways might we look for god's kingdom at this time um, I'm really interested in how many people are talking about just how much their church rose to the challenge of the first wave of lockdown, of the first kind of move into tighter restrictions, buildings closed, and just spilled out all over the community and did all sorts of really interesting things. Um, it's not just that they happen, but that we notice them as the activity of church, as the presence of church in the community. We looked for them as signs of God's kingdom, of the church having just moved out of the building rather than it being closed or, or, or anything else. So what are the things we need to be attentive to in what God is doing in growing God's kingdom? And what new opportunities might there be for living in the now of the kingdom? So there's the tension between now and the not yet. But those the now, where we see those signs already, where we experience something can have that real feeling that we've seen God at work, we've seen Jesus's transformative power, we've seen the Holy Spirit moving people. What new opportunities are there for that in the now, in these next days and, and, and weeks and months? And for us really embracing that together as, as individual Christians and as churches and, and as deaneries and dioceses and as kind of church organisations um, completely. I, as I was just saying there, I think there's a real moment for us to notice how much God is leading us into at, at the moment. So we bring to God all that we have thought about and heard and shared. We bring the people who have come into our minds as we have talked, those who have struggled, those we have lost, those who have been forgotten, those who have energy for the new, those who are looking forward, those who are inspiring us to wonder what and who it is we are called to be. And we lift all of them and ourselves this night to you, O oh God. And we pray, keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all who are brought low, that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Oh,